I'm really, I'm really, I'm truly glad to, to welcome as well Massimo Leone and Harald Plinke uh, today for uh, this um, double uh, talk. Uh, let's begin with Massimo, with the presentation uh, of Massimo, and then uh, after uh, 35 minutes uh, speaking, we'll, uh, we'll give the floor to the room, to the audience, and then to, uh, to Harald. So, um, it's always a pleasure to, to, to present Massimo. Massimo Leone is full professor at the University of Turin in philosophy of communication, and he is a part-time professor of semiotics at Shanghai University in the Department of Chinese Language and Literature, and is a world-renowned specialist in visual semiotics, cultural semiotics, and religious studies. His work is regularly translated into several languages, including Chinese and Persian, and he himself uh, writes in at least five languages, Italian, English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. Uh, it's really difficult to give an overview of his career, but uh, I will try. Uh, his career is so rich and long. So I can't mention all his books. Uh, I will only list a small selection so that you can get an idea of the variety of themes uh, Massimo Le Leone has dealt uh, with. He is the author of Religious Conversion and Identity, the Semiotic Analysis of Texts, Routledge 2004, Saints and Signs, a, sem a Semiotic Reading of Conversion in Early Modern Catholicism, the Gruiter uh, 2010, Semiotic de l'âme, Langage du Changement Spirituel à l'Aube de l'Age Moderne, Press Académique Francophone, Annunciazioni, Percorsi di Semiotica della Religione, Arachne 2014, and a lot of uh, other books in Italian, uh, for instance. He has long been the editor of the important uh, Italian journal Lexia, of the book collections I Saggi di Lexia, of the collection Semiotics of Religion by uh, Walter de Gruyter. Recently, he has been elected as a co-director of the prestigious journal Semiotica, and he is also the director of a new book collection that he has just launched at Routledge on the cultures of the face. He has been a visiting professor or visiting scholar at several universities around the world, including Ecole Normale Superiore in Paris, Trinity College in du Dublin, Ecole Francaise in Rome, University of Fribourg, the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, and then in other cities, Melbourne, Toronto, Berlin, Sorbonne, Kyoto, and so on. And he's currently working at the Center for Research in Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities at Cambridge University. The face in digital studies is the topic of his ARC consolidator grant entitled Facets, Face Aesthetics in Contemporary E-Technological Societies, which runs from uh, <coughs> 2019 to 2024, 24, sorry and has enabled him to recruit a quite big team of promising postdoctoral researchers as well as doctoral students, PhD students, working on the relationship between face and artificial intelligence. His talk today carries forward his uh, ARC project and is entitled The Digital Square, Teaching Visual Semiotics to Artificial Intelligence. Massimo, the floor is yours, and thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, um, uh, Maria Giulia, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. It's always uh, a pleasure being in, in Liège. Um, of course, I would like to be there in person, but uh, it's not possible this time, so I'm delighted anyway to be um, digitally there. Um, and um, I'm particularly honored and, uh, and, and glad because uh, 
uh, I'm part now as a speaker at least of this wonderful project that has been devised by Enzo D'Armenio and uh, with the participation of um, Maria Giulia Dondero, which is in Actis. Um, and I say that it's very difficult to find in present day visual semiotics people who really try to do something new. Um, you come across a lot of um, um, repetition, um, you know, analysis that repeat old schemes without really adding something new. And uh, I, I take the opportunity of this event to say that, uh, you know, in semiotics, you, you either like add a, a genius to some uh, analysis with old methods. Uh, that's not always the case with the, you know, semiotic analysis that you read around. Or you must invent um, new ways of, of carry on um, uh, your investigations, because otherwise, uh, you know what what we do, what we see around, it doesn't really make um, too much sense. You know, it, it sounds like a repeated disc that it's um, starting to 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 sound like a broken disc. So, so mm -hmm. I, I really thank Maria Giulia for for the for 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 being so courageous, actually, because it's not easy to. Uh, to try to uh, um, introduce some novelty in a, within a method that is very established. And so I, I can imagine the difficulties that he has, she has been facing and she's facing. But, uh, but uh, this is the direction to take, you know, that for our younger researchers, uh, this, is, this is the way to do things, you know, to explore new frontiers. Uh, this is also the way to serve semiotics well, you know, to replace and resituate semiotics and visual semiotics among the uh, disciplines that are considered uh, Dane of uh, you know talking to the world about what images uh, um, have to say and uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's it's very important to stress that and I'm really glad that um, I'm sharing this platform with uh, uh, Harald Klinke because uh, uh, we haven't met in person too many times but uh, uh, he's part of the um, advisory board of the project ERC that I lead, Facets, uh, and so is also Maria Giulia. But also I remember that uh, we met in person um, several years ago. It was before that I would uh, apply for this ERC, and uh, he was invited at this beautiful villa together with me at, um, at the Lake Como. Uh, it was an event organized uh, by myself together with Martina Corniati and um, Luca Volli. And uh, there were students from the Brera Academy, and uh, and Harald Klinke was there, and he presented these, uh, you know, absolutely uh, new for everybody methods for studying art history. And I remember that at that time I was a little bit skeptical, but then uh, I must say that reading his his articles and uh, and his journals, he has gained my heart. So I, I really believe that that's also the way to explore to say something new in art history. So sorry for the long introduction, but just to place the meaning of this uh, of this of this event, um, you are probably already familiar with um, with the project facet uh, facets. I've decided to um, give a uh, provocative title to this uh, to this presentation, uh, the title uh, Digital Square: um, Teaching Visual Semiotics to Artificial Intelligence. Uh, the digital square is, of course, a reference to the semiotic square, um, but it's also a reference to the fact that uh, we, we now more and more live in a digital agora. So it's a square in, in which we live as individuals that interact in the, in the cyberspace, in the online world, in the digital world. But at the same time, this square is the name of the most famous uh, tool of uh, Grimassian semiotics. So. Uh, the, the question is, can, can we combine artificial intelligence and Grimassian semiotics, Grimassian semiotics as applied to visual uh, images, for instance? And um, I would like to answer yes, although uh, I must say that I'm really at the beginning of this process. But this is really the direction in which uh, toward which I would like to go uh, in my future studies, uh, not only in relation to semiotics and Grimassian semiotics in particular, but um, uh, about research in general, I think that we cannot really ignore the, the, the enormous power of artificial intelligence and we must appropriate it, we must uh, 
bend it uh, towards our means as uh, scholars in social sciences and humanities. And there is a lot of resistance toward that because uh, we come from um, uh, a field that can be a little bit conservative, uh, just to say a little, uh, maybe I should say very conservative. And, um, and so, you know, if, if you start uh, merging these two fields, artificial intelligence and scholarship in humanities, so scholarship in social sciences, you're going to come across a lot of resistance. And, uh, you know, some of this resistance is um, uh, legitimate because, uh, uh, of course, there are many limits in artificial intelligence and the way it is developed and uh, the tasks it can accomplish and uh, uh, particular biases that it can, that can absorb in being programmed and implemented. And that is a good resistance because, you know, facing that resistance, uh, we shall actually improve the way in which we use these methods for uh, in social sciences and humanities. But then there is also bad resistance. You know, the bad resistance is uh, that of people who use very old arguments like, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is bias, uh, artificial intelligence, in order to convey a sort of very old fashioned conservatism. And um, basically uh, it, it is a resistance towards something that is ignored. Um, and I think that uh, is something we should avoid. You know, we shouldn't be afraid of what we ignore. Uh, we, sh we should know first and then understand the limits of, uh, of uh, you know, this new field, this new method. But uh, I would encourage everyone, especially our young researchers, to be very suspicious of people who uh, reject like new methods and new tools without actually knowing them. You know, that is... Uh, how very old schools of theology have worked for centuries in order to protect the status of you know, such or such leader. So uh, on the contrary, we should venture towards the, the new. And, uh, and as I try to demonstrate through this very brief presentation, it will be more and more important to work in teams and to um, uh, ask for help and seek con con collaboration, cooperation from other uh, researchers and scholars. So this is FACETS. Um, these are my wonderful collaborators at the University of Turin. Um, uh, the um, acronym FACETS means Face Aesthetics in Contemporary E-Technological Societies. It is a project financed by a European Union, by a European Research Council. Um, maybe you know some of these faces. Uh, the group uh, has been constantly growing in the last years. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that now we are the maximum capacity because I'm really ambitious. So I, I constantly want to hire new people. So as soon as I have resources, I tend to expand uh, this group because I feel that uh, the interaction within the group is very good. And uh, like each one of these faces corresponds to a different uh, series of skills and competencies, uh, which are very various. So, and uh, the face is a very complex object to study. And uh, as a consequence, uh, you know, all these competencies are need needed. But uh, my dream would be to have a, a even more diversified team, you know, containing not only semioticians, philosophers of language, lawyers, engineers, but also like, people working in other fields, you know, biology, for instance, uh, natural sciences. Because um, I think this is a true vocation of semiotics that we should recover as well, you know, not to be afraid of interacting face-to-face uh, -face with other disciplines. And um, uh, this is something that uh, should be done, I think. So this is the project description. Uh, it is the project description that has been prepared by the European Union. It's available in different languages. You know, like uh, from time to time they add a new language. Now I've seen that. Uh, I was pleased to see that there is a Polish uh, description, Polish translation. Um, but it is branded. This project is branded by ERC as innovative cross-disciplinary face perception study. Uh, this is the identity card of the project, uh, the grant agreement. Uh, the starting date is 1st of June 2019. Uh, the end date will be 30th of November 2024. When, when Maria Giulia said 2044, I, I, felt, I felt so tired because, uh, you know, so, because uh, it's a wonderful adventure. But at the same time, you know, I must say that I'll be very happy when it's completed. 
And uh, the budget, the overall budget is uh, is a little bit short of 2 million euros, and it's hosted by University of Turin. So this is the description that is for the wider audience. So selfies are posted on social media networks and masks are donned by anti-establishment activists like Anonymous. Photorealistic 3D printed face prosthetics also exist that can trick facial recognition software and conceal the wearer's identity. These are examples of how facial aesthetics are evolving as an important influence on social behavior. The EU-founded FACETS project will combine visual history, semiotics, phenomenology, visual anthropology, and face perception status as regards the cognitions, emotions, and actions people attach to the interaction with ones and others' faces. The project will review the effects in terms of alterations in self-perception. It, it will also collect, analyze, and socially contextualize big data to identify the cultural and technological causes of these cha changes. So I would like you to focus on the first sentence. It will also collect, analyze, and socially contextualize big data to identify the cultural and technological causes of these changes. So this is a sentence that has kept me um, sleepless for many nights, uh, I would say months or even years, because this is exactly what I promised to the European Research Council. This was probably the most innovative part of my research project, which I think wasn't funded because of the presence of semiotics. You know, semiotics, of course, is a wonderful discipline, but uh, uh, I doubt they would have given me this um, uh, funding of 2 million euros just to carry on some semiotic analysis because, uh, um, you know, for the simple fact that uh, they don't usually entail any like infrastructural costs. Um, but this sentence kept me sleepless because for months, if not years, I would say, I thought that I would be never able to live up to this promise. So I thought that actually that was just a promise that was stealing European Research Council's money to do some like um, conventional semiotics. And, um, and not because I didn't want to carry on this sentence into a concrete project, but because I realized that it was so difficult. It was very difficult. Uh, why was it difficult? Because uh, first of all, I didn't have the experience to work on big data and to carry on quantitative analysis. All my career beforehand, uh, before this ERC project, had been about qualitative analysis. But I must say that while I was doing qualitative analysis, you know, I was um, analyzing texts relating religious conversion or paintings representing sanctity or um, the other texts that really took me my attention and was uh, really very interesting to me. All the time, I was asking myself a question that probably, I don't know if it's legitimate in semiotics, but, you know, I must be honest, I was constantly asking this question to myself. And the question was, is this corpus representative? Uh, I, am I really investigating or I'm just uh, confirming my hypothesis by choosing the text that better suit my initial hypothesis? So is there a resistance of the corpus vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, my methodology? Uh, or there is something circular in my in my proceedings. And uh, even then, at that time, I was dreaming of introducing a perspective that would um, combine the qualitative approach of semiotics with the possibility of enlarging the corpus of analysis so that it would become more and more representative. And that was not so crucial when I would study, let's say, um, micro-cultural context, uh, like, I don't know, the circulation of religious texts in the 17th century. But when I started working on contemporary issues, because I also I like, focused uh, on religious fundamentalism, for instance, you know, I thought my, to myself, but, you know, is it enough to study one Islamist website? I shouldn't um, carry on an extensive analysis to all Islamist websites to say something um, uh, more solid um, about what is happening in this, um, uh, you know, discursive arena. And uh, and so I, th that was the initial idea of facets, you know, to uh, harvest 
uh, big data, visual big data uh, from the internet and in, in particular from social networks and to uh, carry on this analysis with uh, a different means. So the first idea that I had was to use Amazon Turks. And I even gave a presentation um, some years ago at, uh, at a Congress of the Italian Association for Semiotic Studies. You know, I, I remember the reaction, you know, like, this is not a topic that you want to present to the International Association, I mean, the Italian Association for Semiotic Studies. You know, uh, just the word Amazon would be rejected. But the idea was to use Amazon Turks. And what are Amazon Turks? Amazon Turks is a market for a distributed uh, cognitive uh, um, uh, skills. So if you have a, a research task that requires the um, uh, activity of many researchers, if you, for instance, you want to analyze uh, like 1,000 images, 1 million images, uh, you cannot do it on your own and you cannot do it with your own team as well. You know, my team is now like 15 researchers, so like it would be too little to analyze, you know, 10,000 images. So one method would be to um, distribute the corpus among these um, anonymous workers uh, that are handled by Amazon in uh, like markets that uh, Amazon owns, but there are also alternatives to Amazon. So it's, the only, it's not the only one. And basically you distribute, you distribute these images and then you ask Turks uh, to uh, accomplish very um, simple tasks on these images. So you ask very simple questions, but at the same time, these questions would be uh, too complicated to uh, deal with by machines. Or at, or at least that was the case when I wrote the project. I wrote the project in 2018. Uh, so it's already like almost three, four years ago. Um, and at that time, I thought that uh, for some simple tasks, like, like identifying the type of face that was in, a, in an image, in a digital, digital image, I couldn't ask a machine, I should actu actually ask human beings. And at the same time, if I wanted to keep this quantitative uh, dimension in the project, it was impossible to work with a small team in Turin. I had to um, rely to what I call the semi-automated uh, method. So distribute these images to Turks and then receive their feedback. Um, that was impossible, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, this, uh, this talk is also uh, a way to say to young researchers that these projects always um, come across uh, obstacles and some of these obstacles cannot be actually um, overcome. So the only way is to change the direction of the project. I had to change the direction of the project because I couldn't hire these Turks for legal reasons because these Turks were handled by a US company, Amazon. Whatever project is financed by the European Research Council must uh, rely to resources that are external to European Union to the minimum, uh, because otherwise ERC goes into a lot of administrative and legal trouble. So this was one problem. The second problem was that the project deals with images of faces of people, you know, existing people. So you cannot actually send these images out to Turks whose identity and even like civic and legal status you don't perfectly know. So you cannot know, for instance, whether these people who are handled by Amazon are obliged to adhere with the, the uh, European legal framework when they analyze images. So they might use these images, for instance, for purposes that are different um, uh, from those uh, for which they were hired. They could, for instance, take these images and, um, and use these images to do a back research on Google image or with other tools in order to know something about the identity of the people who are represented in these images. Or they could, they could use these facial images in order to um, build some uh, um, uh, artificial uh, identities, so some bots, some visual bots. Um, which is, you know, more and more the case in the contemporary world. So this was not a, an issue. 
this was simply a final stop. Uh, it was an idea that they had when they wrote the project, but it couldn't actually be implemented, mainly for uh, administrative and legal reasons. The other problem was that I was working at the University of Turin, and uh, when uh, the European Union gave me these two million euros, I thought that the University of Turin would do everything to suit my needs as a researcher and uh, give me all the resources I needed in order to carry on this project. Well, unfortunately, that was not the case. Uh, and one problem was the infrastructure. So there wasn't adequate infrastructure at the University of Turin in order to uh, carry on this, um, this project. Um, you see, this was the initial objective of the project. Face it status, the meaning of the face in contemporary visual cultures. There are two complementary research fossae widespread practices of face exhibition in social networks like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Tinder, and minority practices of occultation, including the mask in anti-establishment political activism and in anti-surveillance artistic provocation, and blah, blah, blah. And here, too, I was promising to uh, carry on uh, some uh, um, quantitative analysis of big data. So uh, basically, there was a um, whole part of the project that I couldn't carry on because of the legal restrictions of the uh, European Research Council and because of the lack of adequate infrastructure at the University of Turin. And then after two years of trouble, of thinking and rethinking how to come out of this situation, Two years seems a lot of time, but for a project of this kind, it's not a long time at all because uh, dealing with the, the European Union and the uh, European Research Council uh, sometimes uh, takes ages. I came across these two wonderful people, um, Professor Lia Mora and Professor Fabrizio Lamberti from Turin's Polytechnical University. So there was a, a moment uh, in the project where I thought, OK, I'm going to move the project somewhere else at a university where they actually have in infrastructure to uh, to carry on this project. I, I'm going to move the project to Liège, to F FNRS. Um, but then all of a sudden I thought, well, but come on. I mean, Turin is the place where there is probably the best polytechnical school in Italy, where the top engineers in Italy are trained. So why don't we ask them? Uh, if they can help. And through a collaborator of, uh, of mine that I won't thank uh, enough ever, uh, his name is uh, Antonio Santangelo, um, I got in contact with uh, these two professors uh, who are professors in the Department of um, uh, um, Automation uh, at the University, at the Turin Polytechnic University. Now, uh, this was not easy either because we had to find people who could help us. But of course, our project and our, um, let's say, goal was not a goal for engineering and for uh, people usually work on very specific projects. Um, but then I went through the CVs of many people working at the Turin Polytechnical University and I realized that these two people were working for actually Fiat, which is the uh, most important car manufacturer in Italy. And they were working on a very <clears throat> specific project that was implementing artificial intelligence on um, uh, cars and other devices uh, related to with uh, um, uh, automobile uh, industry that would detect when the road is wet. Now, that seems a very simple task. So understanding if the road is wet or is dry. I mean, for us human beings is something incredibly easy to, to do. But it is very difficult to teach artificial intelligence, especially in conditions of dim light, especially in conditions of artificial light, to understand whether a surface is wet or not and um, how much it has rained. Uh, this is one of the problems that are dealt with by the um, people who work with artificial intelligence applied to the automobile. So I thought, wow, maybe these people can actually help me to analyze other kinds of images and not images of wet roads, but images of faces. 
And so I asked them, and they were very enthusiastic. They thought that uh, it could be stimulating for them. Technically, we created a secondary beneficiary, so we moved some of the money to Turin's Polytechnical University, and they started, started working on the project. And that was the beginning of Fresco, which is a branch of facets. Fresco uh, is another acronym. Uh, I'm a specialist in acronyms, so if one day you want an acronym, please ask me, because uh, I'm like creating acronyms every day. Acronyms are very important for European projects. They're most impor more important than the project itself. So Fresco, Fresco means face representations in e-societies through computational observation. And I chose this, um, this acronym because uh, uh, it is uh, uh, both an Italian and an English word. In Italian, it means fresh. But in English, it means uh, what in Italian is an affresco. So it's a way of painting. And so I uh, liked this idea of combining something refreshing, like applying artificial intelligence to visual images uh, in social networks, uh, and something that would give us a fresco, a global picture of how people use uh, facial images in, uh, in social networks. And so uh, fresco became the quantitative line of research of facets in cooperation with professors Lia Mora and Fabrizio Lamberti and their team. It's a wonderful team of PhD students uh, in, uh, uh, at the Polytechnical University of Turin and concentrates on three data sets in order of priority, depending on resources available. Why depending on resources available? Because these research, these kinds of research are actually costly. So you, you must limit your goals in order to um, uh, take the most advantage from the infrastructure that you have. So first, digital images used as account profile pictures in social networks, Facebook and Instagram. As you see, we eliminated Tinder because there was no way to work on Tinder and at the same time respecting the like, legal rules and legal framework of the uh, GDPR and uh, European Research Council. And two pre-digital images of faces from art and visual history, and this is how facets might actually join at some stage, Harald Klinke's uh, line of research. And third, artificial facial images generated by GAN generative adversarial networks is something a little bit more complicated, but uh, um, you know we won't have time to talk about it today. Um, we concentrated on the first line of um, um, uh, research. So uh, Fresco's facets uh, priority is to study data sets of social network profile pictures in order to understand how users represent their identity in the digital world, often through images of the faces, but sometimes also through replacing them with other kinds of images presented as faces, so landscapes, so VIPs, political symbols, etc. We shall see that that constitutes a problem in the implementation of the project because not everyone on Facebook uses his or her, her own face as a profile face. You know, some people use uh, symbols, some people use faces of VIPs, some people use monuments, and some people use faces of other people who are private citizens. Uh, this is illegal. It would be illegal in Facebook, but uh, the consequence is that uh, it would be legal for us to study that, that picture. So facets does not work with previous data sets, but ambitions to build its own throughout the methodology explained in this uh, presentation. Within the FACETS collection, profile images are linked to sociodemographic information such as age, gender, nationality, and so forth. So it is important to stress that building a new data set uh, of visual images is a very important ambition for people working in this field, in the field of artificial intelligence applied to images. You know, for us, conventional semioticians, the most important thing is to publish a paper, for instance, or to publish a book. But for my colleagues, the engineers, uh, uh, Professor Lamberti and Professor Mora, well, they don't really care too much about publishing a new paper or publishing a new book. What they want to publish is a new data set. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, a set of data, in this case visual data, that then other thousand scholars will use as a reference, citing and quoting this data set in their papers or in their books. 
So this is much more important to have your age index grow, you know, in the scientific world than having a paper or having a, a book published. Uh, so it's a new way of uh, addressing also the academic work. Um, so I completely lost any idea of how much I should talk because I'm so passionate. So it was 30 minutes. Uh, 35, but you can uh, okay. you can go so, so, so further. Uh, okay. I Let's just give a glimpse of how it works. Ten minutes and then, uh, more maximum. Ten minutes. Okay, okay, okay. So, so uh, how does it that does Fresco work? The quantitative analysis of large scale data moves beyond the pictorial analysis of individual faces to build a dynamic picture in which facial icon types can be seen in their evolution and mutual interaction with historical events and social cultural trends. In addition. The collection of socio-demographic information allows to assess the representativeness of the collection and enables the creation of representative and balanced samples through sampling strategies. The collected images are processed using a combination of existing software tools, as well as new artificial intelligence components developed ad hoc during the project. An overview of the process is provided in this picture. So there is data collection first, then there is data cleaning, because not all the data that are collected can be used for the analysis. Then there is data storage, which is important because we have to secure that all images are secure, are safe, and are anonymized. So we don't want anyone to assess, uh, to access uh, this data set of facial images. Uh, just remember, please, that the face is one of our treasures. Uh, in the present day economy. So it's something to be protected. Um, then this um, data that have been collected, cleaned and stored uh, and anonymized undergo through parallel processes. One process of quantitative morphological analysis that uses existing tools for a facial analysis and uh, um, a second process that is more creative, more inventive, that is a process of deep learning that involves new labeling of this uh, annotation of these images, giving rise uh, uh, to a neural network inspection. Results from the quantitative morphological analysis and the neural network inspection are combined in terms of visualization and analytics. So this is a natural. Uh, this is the system that is used in order to gather uh, facial images from uh, you know, basically social networks. Uh, we are working mostly on Facebook, uh, also on Instagram, but for reasons that are a little bit complicated to explain, Facebook is much more easy to deal with in order to harvest these facial images than Instagram. Um, so the user interacts with uh, faces. Sorry, there's something very simple like electricity that sometimes messes things. Okay. Um, so the user interacts with Faces Web Client and uh, uh, Faces Web Client um, uh, sends uh, data to the identity server, to the identity database, and at the same time connects the client with the Faces um, API server that uh, gives rise to both uh, the Faces database, the image server, and uh, transmits data to the identity server. The identity server then is uh, uh, the element through which the user can actually access uh, Facebook through a dedicated login uh, and uh, a specific API on Facebook is used in order to uh, have the user interact with Faces Web Client. So I'm going to explain this in very simple terms. What we do is to um, uh, ask the user, the user who accepts to be, let's say, studied by us through a very complicated series of documents that he or she has to accept you know, abide with, uh, abide with. Um, um, we ask the user whether he wants to donate uh, some uh, images from the profile uh, that he or she has on Facebook. Um, and then we ask him or her also if she or he wants to donate the entirety of these profile pictures. 
Uh, and this can be automated through a Facebook API, uh, making everything much uh, smoother, let's say much quicker, because basically the, the user who accepts to do that doesn't have to upload the images in our server, in our system. All the images that are present, that are used as profile images on his or her Facebook account are transferred in our a data set. And then um, these are some of the um, operations that are uh, carry on, carried on uh, through existing uh, algorithms of um, uh, uh, analysis of uh, facial Im digital facial images. So th these are algorithms that are basically available on the market and uh, most of them are available for free. We had to select them also um, uh, on the basis of uh, like legal restrictions, but you know some of them are very common: face detection, face key points, face orientation, emotion detection, body pose, object detection, um, and then um, also um, uh, text recognition, uh, color histogram with palette and grayscale, sepia filters detection. Something that is quite um, uh, you know, elementary in in the face analysis. Um, the other parallel line, which involves the programming of specific neural networks and deep learning, uh, semi-supervised uh, deep learning for the analysis of these facial images, is much more creative, because we are going to actually tell these neural networks what we are looking for, or something which is even more creative, we're going to let these neural networks find their own regularities in facial images and tell us uh, what kind of patterns they discover. So we're not going to ask them to find any particular patterns and go uh, along some particular lines. We're going to basically let them find their regularities in facial images and then see if these regular like regularities make sense for us too. Uh, the, the humans that look at these images. Now, all this process took an enormous time in terms of uh, dealing with the ethics of ERC, uh, just to you know, uh, demonstrate how difficult it was. I show you the roadmap of all the documents that we had to comply with in order to finally be able to implement this, uh, this system. And the, the, the final authorization came Last week, so the project started in June 2019. The final authorization of ERC ethics uh, was uh, uh, transmitted. Yeah, this was downloaded the 22nd of November. So it was really, really recent. It was a struggle, but a struggle through which we also learned a lot about the ethics of digital images. And so this is how the system looks like now. It's not visible to the general public because we are still testing it. So you access a sub branch of the uh, website of facets and in in this website uh, for the moment is just in Italian. Um, you are connected to your Facebook account and you see all the images that you have used along the years as profile um, images on your Facebook account and you can uh, um, uh, choose to metterci la faccia. No, metterci la faccia is an Italian expression to see, put your face in it. So you can donate your face to science somehow. And, and uh, this is what I've done. So these are all the images that I've used as, a, as profile uh, pictures in my Facebook account since 2006. Uh, 76 images that I've donated uh, to this project. You can see me in different parts of the world. Uh, you can see that there are some patterns. Of course, as a semiotician, I see that there are some patterns. But now uh, I would like to see whether neural networks recognize some patterns as well and how these patterns can be recognized in big data. So, for instance, uh, uh, the presence of architecture, the presence of a certain atmosphere, the presence of a certain kind of weather, um, the presence of a certain attire, the inclination of the face, the presence of animals. Um, the replacement of the face, my face, with faces of other objects, so for instance, line sculptures, uh, the predominance of certain animals in, in um, uh, uh, profile uh, facial images. The fact that until I got married, I was an individual on Facebook, and then I got married and I started to have a dual uh, profile picture. So 
that was a problem for our system because uh, we had to um, uh, make sure that users that donate, who donate their images, uh, donate only the images of their face and not the images of the faces of other people who are in the same picture. So the system now asked me to identify myself and blurs the image of uh, other people who might be with me in the same picture because I don't have the right to give other faces, other uh, people's faces to uh, to this system. So this is really natural, and uh, I hope that this system will be uh, publicly available um, soon. And I hope that uh, you'll also be willing to uh, donate your your face to science. Although your face is, is a blank face, although you, you don't have any image on your Facebook account, that is important for us too, because it, it is also part of the statistics. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry, I was a little bit long. Thank you, Massimo. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing your path uh, uh, before and during your C project. It was very, very interesting to, to understand uh, how um, it's different to prepare a project, to, to begin the project, to, uh, to be inside the project and uh, how to, to look forward. Um, I, I can uh, ask to the, to the audience if someone wants to ask a question, uh, I would begin probably with uh, one question. I have a lot of questions, but I begin with one because we have not so many time. And I hope that uh, the audience uh, will uh, will be ready when <laughs> when I will um, uh, give uh, give uh, them the floor. Um, I want to ask you something about. Uh, um, Something you said at the very beginning of your uh, of your uh, talk about the uh, exemplarity of your corpus. Um, it's difficult to, to, to speak about the corpora now, in the sense that uh, yes, there is big data uh, collections of images, but uh, we cannot uh, call them uh, cor corpora. Um, I. Um, I, I think I, I only reflected a little bit about uh, the relationship of, uh, between uh, qualitative and quantitative analysis, and I found that uh, the, the Manovich analysis and other kind of uh, clusters analysis of big uh, collections of images can help us to um, find to to choose the 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 part of this environment of data uh, because this uh, large environment of data offers you uh, various regions uh, through different parameters so it's not really an analysis i i don't think that we really can call uh, anal analytical uh, the the quantitative uh, uh, the, the quantitative positioning of clusters but it's a pre uh, an analysis i think to to choose to choose a cluster to choose some kind of patterns and uh, or um, it al um, this procedure allows you to uh, to uh, how to say to 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 find a position of this cluster of your corpus inside uh, a large environment, a large amount of data, and so on. So I think that this pre-analytical. Uh, um, process is already ve very, very important, very, very useful. But uh, I want to ask you if you have other ideas of uh, combining uh, this, uh, this qualitative and quantitative uh, anal analysis in the perspective of uh, construction of corpora, intertext intertextuality, and so on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, it, this is a central question. 
um, of course, as um, as someone who as someone who works predominantly with qualitative methods, uh, that is the line that you usually explore the first. So, using um, big data and um, um, machine learning um, in order to um, uh, shape your corpus of analysis. So having uh, a larger quantity of text uh, that you can analyze and then have uh, a grasp on this very large corpus uh, and have also some statistics that you wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, this is the first line, but it's probably something that uh, is already part of many um, disciplinary traditions. It is even, uh, I would say, almost conventional uh, now, um, exactly for what you were saying. So this is just the preparation of a corpus e e into clusters that then give rise to your own interpretation as a human interpreter of those clusters. But there is a second uh, uh, step, and uh, I really would like to go toward that second step if I have the ability to do that in the future to use artificial intelligence as an agent of interpretation. So, and not only in statistical terms, but also um, in other qualitative terms. Um, well, uh, to give you an example, in social sciences, there are more and more experiments in a field that I studied uh, a little bit, uh, uh, religious fundamentalism. There are more and more experiments with the so-called a multi-agent uh, artificial intelligence, which is uh, a field in which you use artificial intelligence to uh, create some um, agents that, for instance, take these decisions in certain contexts, but are not human agents. They are artificial agents. So if you create a huge number of these artificial agents and you study uh, through complex mathematics, um, the Monte Carlo scheme, for instance, which is a little bit the idea that uh, um, by uh, running randomly a certain process, like the roulette, for instance, that's why it's called Monte Carlo scheme, you can actually uh, come across a, a, the solution of a complex mathematical uh, problem that involves a lot of uh, um, uh, variables. So this is something that he used, for instance, when uh, um, a bot is lost in the ocean um, and it's impossible to contact this boat. So you have to come up with some hypothesis about where in the ocean this boat is. And this is when this Monte Carlo statistics is adopted by running random a simulation a million of times, you actually come across a plausible answer about where this boat might be. Um, and this has been implemented now, is being implemented more and more in decision making, for instance. Um, but this is just one example, because uh, what we are doing in facets is to, uh, as I was saying before, letting the neural networks uh, uh, build up their own clusters uh, along lines that uh, uh, we tend to not pre-program. Uh, but uh, according to um, a dynamics that are almost uh, not supervised or semi-supervised, and then um, try to investigate whether these clusters that have been created by um, deep learning make sense to us, uh, not because we want to interpret them somehow, but because we want to understand how machines interpret images. So the effort now is not only to make artificial intelligence help us with our interpretation, but try to understand uh, what we still don't know about the machinic interpretation, uh, how machines interpret images, because this is, and it, it will be more and more in the future, uh, mysterious. And not even those who program these algorithms know uh, what the final result will be. Uh, and so it is important for us to develop this you know, hermeneutic um, uh, approach to artificial intelligence in a way. Mm -hmm. So I see these two lines, you know, like not only the traditional lines of uh, 
the qualitative, I mean, the statistical preparation pre-clustering of the corpus, but also the simulation of human cognitive behaviors, uh, for instance, um, uh, when an agent is facing an image. Um, I mean, uh, neurosciences mostly use human subjects dealing with reaction to images. Then they usually don't realize that images are different from reality, but it's a problem of neuroscientists. But, um, but what about using artificial intelligence agents in order to study the reaction of human beings to images? Um, this is the second line. The third line, even more complicated, is to develop a sort of a hermeneutics of the machinic interpretation. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, the, this problem of um, understanding machine interpretation is a topic that uh, that uh, we we will uh, uh, focus on in the number uh, 14 of Signata Journal. So I will uh, will spread the the call for papers, but it's um, it's really this that we are interested in the. The, um, the form of life uh, of a machine uh, in uh, in reading images, reactions to images, and so on. Someone else, quick yes. question. Uh, hello, Massimo. I, Hi. Uh, I can you can you hear? Can you, can you hear <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and uh, uh, it's of course very interesting. Not uh, how you create your corpus in the first place, which is technically rather simple, but uh, legally quite difficult, which is a finding for itself interesting. And also this Facebook app that now collects uh, um, uh, images is very interesting. But the, the goal is, as far as I understand and see from your presentation, from your slide, is that you want to compare how the image, uh, how the machine sees looks at images and how the human looks at images, right? And at what level does this take place? One level could be a mere visual level, that is, we humans look at images and the machine looks at images, or the other way around, that we are on a data level, that means we uh, somehow get data from humans, for example, eye tracking or something like this, and then compare that on an abstract um, algorithmic level. You know what I mean? Because that's the interesting thing here, if we compare artificial intelligence and natural intelligence or uh, neural networks in the computer, neural networks on our uh, neocortex, for example, we have similar structures, which are similar, but of course also very different. And the question is, on what level do we compare them? Oh, this is a very, very nice question. Thank you so much. Um, this is something that I would like to develop more and more. Um, and also feeling the need to contaminate semiotics uh, increasingly, not only with uh, like artificial intelligence studies, but also neurosciences. Um, one of our researchers is a, is a cognitive scientist, not a neuroscientist, but you know he has a lot of information, and uh, so it stimulates us to um, as semioticians to work in in that direction. Um, and I'm fascinated, for instance, uh, by the fact that uh, in studying the synaptic networks that um, uh, enable a memory, for instance, in human brains. Um, more and more the importance of, uh, let's say, macrostructures that technically are called engrams, synaptic engrams, is, uh, is emphasized. So, um, to say it in a nutshell, there would be some uh, super memories or structural memories that somehow take shape uh, in uh, the networks of um, uh, synaptic links and that then are very important uh, uh, in order to make sure that other, let, let's say, micro memories are attached to that engram. So the, uh, the, the structure would be hierarchical and, uh, and it would actually follow a sort of a grammar of this synaptic construction. Um, it would be interesting to compare, in particular, this multi-level constitution of visual memory to the multi-level constitution of, uh, um, let's say, uh, links 
in neural networks. This is just one, uh, one direction. Uh, but I'm, I'm fascinated mostly by the second line that you envisaged and the, and the first one. Uh, I mean, the University of Turin is now endowed with a new laboratory that enables research in virtual reality and high tracking. And uh, um, one possibility would be to, uh, of course, uh, use that in order to do some empirical semiotics as well. Um, but it's not probably what fascinates me the most. You know, what fascinates me the most is to, again, uh, understand uh, uh, a, at a deeper level how um, um, images are turned into, uh, let's say, structured information and uh, um, compare the way in which it happens in human beings with the way it happens in, uh, in machines. Uh, I must say also that in many circumstances, we don't completely know what we are going to see or what we're going to find, uh, especially because uh, we are interacting with other specialists uh, that have a knowledge that is very specific. And uh, of course, they try to explain to us what they are doing, but uh, up to a certain level. And beyond that level, um, it is mysterious for us. But I must say that it's reciprocal because semiotics is also mysterious to them beyond a certain <laughs> level. So the, the interaction between these two um, the teams with, um, with skills that are only imperfectly known by the other one creates also a space for uncertainty that could be a catastrophe, of course. I mean, we, we don't find anything. Uh, we, we, we run like we waste our resources and so on and so forth, but could also be fruitful, meaning that uh, we see probably as semioticians in uh, the applications of artificial intelligence possibilities that they don't, uh, engineers don't, and vice versa, engineers uh, in, show us that uh, our uh, idea of using artificial intelligence simply as a tool uh, is not totally, um, let's say, doesn't do complete justice to what, at the moment, artificial intelligence is able to do. Uh, so to gain an autonomy that uh, probably we're not, as humanists, totally aware of. Uh, the disciplinarity that you described is, of course, a challenge on the one hand, but has the potential to be very fruitful, and I think at this uh, in, in this area, I think uh, it can be very fruitful and very interesting. Sometimes the, 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 the path you walk is already the goal itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, it's also the purpose of uh, ERC projects. You know, the, I, I am telling to the younger researchers who would like to apply, the, the motto is uh, high risk, high gain. So you must take some risky roads that must, might look crazy to most of the people you work with, um, but uh, they might be fruitful. So it's, it's an investment uh, which is uh, risky, um, you know, structurally defined and conceived as, as a risky investment. Yeah. Massimo, we have a question by a, PH, a Brazilian PhD student that is here in Liege for a year, Karina. Hi. Oh, Karina. Hi, Karina. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to thank you for the speech. It was great. And I have a question. It's actually more of a curiosity. Uh, how much of programming did you actually have to learn in order to analyze this corpora? Because, uh, I mean, the, <laughs> analyzing big data and all these things like uh, um, intelligence, all that, I mean, it's so intricate. I, I would like, she, uh, like to know how much of programming did you actually have to learn in order to analyze it? That's it. Well, or you know, at this at this <laughs> level, before I could actually master the. Ah, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. You, you haven't finished. Maybe. I don't know. It's okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at this level, before I reach the level of the undergraduates who work in the engineer uh, department with my. <laughs> partners at the Polytechnic University, it would take ages just to say that uh, um, it, it is not something that you can acquire very quickly and it's not something that you can be proficient and advanced in, uh, in very little time. Uh, and it would be a tremendous waste of time and energies 
trying to acquire competencies that you can actually cooperate with. So um, our, well, my objective as a PI of the project is to be able to have a general view of all the skills and to be able to understand what people do and what the possibilities are. That requires a lot of study, but uh, but I, 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 my, my goal is not to be a programmer, is to understand what the reach of programming might be. Uh, my goal is not to become a natural scientist, but to understand enough of the functioning of the brain in order to guide the creation of a new meta language, because this is what us semioticians are very good at. So creating a new meta language that um, enables conversation among uh, fields of knowledge, experts and researchers that are not usually in communication with each other. So I would say uh, we, we should work with excellent programmers we should work with excellent um, uh, uh, um, experts in law, for, for instance. I mean, uh, in order to deal with all the complex ethics uh, of this project, I could have learned the law myself, but it would have taken ages because it's so complicated. So we hired a specialist in uh, the law of artificial intelligence to deal with the ethical issues. Um, and that's the way to proceed. You know, we shouldn't try, I think, to encompass all the skills in ourselves, but we should build teams where these skills are present at the highest level and then try to have them communicate with each other. Yes, sure, sure. Massimo, I have a small question. Uh, I can, I have to, to, to ask this question because you'll not be uh, You'll not, you'll not uh, be there for dinner tonight, so I need... Uh, Such a pity. The, the, I need, but uh, I, I try to be very brief, and you as well. Uh, what can visual semiotics uh, categories uh, do for uh, artificial intelligence? Because uh, I think that uh, our plastic, cate plastic formal categories are already known uh, by artificial intelligence. What is not known is our structuralistic way of using the categories in the sense that uh, no um, no computer scientist uh, use the idea of uh, opposite uh, opposite terms uh, of the uh, same category. So our semi-symbolism is not known. Okay. Um, something else that is not known is the holistic uh, uh, vision uh, towards images. Uh, it's always a motif that you can find in other clusters and so on. It's always a similarity of uh, element or uh, part of element. So um, I think that ver there is much to do, but not with uh, deep learning, but because deep learning is uh, independent. Probably for, in for visual semiotics, it's more interesting to use the ancient uh, methods like uh, feature extraction, because I think that there we have more um, more possibility to to, to, to be an agent an agent uh, of uh, of uh, metamorphosis uh, inside of these uh, these methods. What what do you think about uh, about? Well, uh, yeah. I think this is very crucial. I mean. Um, uh, I, I dream of uh, dealing with artificial intelligence uh, as if uh, I, I were dealing with, uh, you know, an undergraduate like <laughs> who doesn't know semiotics yet, but uh, at the same time has sort of a natural tendency to uh, perceive a, a contrast, for instance, or positions in, in images. Um, and I think that um, at a certain basic level, we might easily have uh, artificial intelligence come up with uh, semiotic analysis that resembles uh, that resemble papers by undergraduates of semiotics, meaning that uh, they deal with uh, very visible and very simple contrasts uh, and oppositions. And, and of course, our discipline uh, is somehow issued from the same epistemology 
that has given rise to artificial intelligence. And that's why we can so fruitfully cooperate with artificial intelligence. Um, not to reduce everything in terms of binarism, but uh, uh, I mean, the idea that uh, uh, the result of meaning is somehow um, generative, which is the purpose of uh, generative semiotics, in massive semiotics, is something that uh, we can mutatis mutandis find in the uh, functioning of a lot of informatics and a lot of artificial intelligence. So um, uh, somehow the generational conception of uh, how intelligence works, the semiotic intelligence and the artificial intelligence uh, put us in contact much more than, for instance, I don't know, if you take the method of uh, Giulio Carlo Argan, uh, an art historian, uh, well, delightful, you know, you can write his books and be, but of course you cannot really put him in contact with artificial intelligence because that epistemology comes from another uh, source, which is but not... Uh, it's, yeah. I think hmm? uh, methods by person is not useful uh, neither for uh, artificial intelligence, I think. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that, yeah, probably. I mean, uh, um, uh, all those methods that uh, understand uh, meaning in terms of uh, combinatorics, in terms of generation, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, recombination of elements that are known into elements that are not known. I mean, all these can be easily translated into a machinic. Um, but then probably we'll have to uh, somehow uh, um, go beyond that as well, uh, meaning that at some stage artificial intelligence will work in a different way, will be more, much more qualitative than it is now. Um, uh, it will absorb, because you know in our brain there is a, 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 an element of uh, combinatorial uh, yeah. connections among uh, uh, synapses, but there is also, for instance, just to give an example, a, uh, an, a crucial role of reinforcement, which is, which is quantitative. So the, the more you see an image, the more you remember it. And that, that is not combinatorial. That depends yeah. on the fact that there is a, 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 quantitative, a quantitative accumulation of potential, electric potential in your synapses. But um, uh, so we we'll have to explore more ways, but uh, I, I agree with you that, uh, that the potential is, is very, very high. Uh, even in the holistic and the not combinatory uh, point of view, because finally I think that uh, we look at oppositions, yes, at recombination, yes, but uh, firstly we look uh, holistically at uh, an image. Especially if we are art historians, uh, uh, that we really know that an image has to be taken as a totality and not as an, an accumulation of uh, different motives and so on and so on. But I will, um, I will, uh, I, I, I thank you very much, Massimo, for your generosity as a, as always. And uh, thank you, thank you. It was a pleasure. I'm gonna stay a little bit longer to sit, to yes. listen to Harold. Yes, Harold. yes. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to, to welcome Harald today in Liège. He, he, it's uh, his uh, second time in Liège. Harald Klink is an uh, art historian uh, and uh, uh, teaches at the Ludwig Maximilian. Uh, 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 ah, okay, you take your. I, I trust me. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yes, yes, I trust you. Um, he teaches at the Ludwig Maximilian University uh, Munich. He began his career as a con conventional, in a sense, art historian with a work on Durer's uh, uh, portraiture in 2004, which is the focus of his uh, first book. And uh, afterwards, he published the second monography on the history of American painting in 2011. After a master in information sciences in 2014, he devoted his work to immersive user interfaces using 3D graphics, and he's today a very active and influential scholar in the fields of digital art history and digital image science. 
He's the editor-in-chief of the well-known international journal of, for digital art history, which is a very useful journal and the first one totally devoted to uh, digital art history. Moreover, uh, he, in uh, 2021, he obtained his habilitation, Venia Legendi, in Germany, in modern digital art, uh, with a dissertation entitled Interfaces, Interactions and Infrastructures, Image-Based Application Systems for Art, History and Digital Humanities. His fourth uh, coming book, will be published by Springer and will be about the data visualization for digital art history. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I hope uh, the audience in the virtual space can hear me well. I think you do as well. Um, and thank you, Massimo, for the kind words at the beginning. And um, I do remember when we met at the Lake Como and I uh, hope we'll meet again in real in, in, in person once again soon. So I'm very happy to be here in a community of semiotics, obviously, and uh, because I'm interested, as we just discussed, in interdisciplinary work. I mean, I'm an art historian, and as, as art historians, we are uh, all humanists, but still I'm standing here as an art historian. And from that point of view, I'm, I'm talking to you. Art historians, um, usually, in a conventional way, are interested in artworks, of course, and they are looking at images of artworks, usually, and derive information from it in order to gain an, an idea of what this artwork is about and connect it to other artworks in order to kind of have a narration of, of the history of art. But as digital art historians, we tend to create images ourselves, by what we call meta-images. These are images that show images of artworks. And this is very important to us as an epistemologic uh, tool, but also those meta-images need a kind of interpretation, of course. And we need to know how those meta-images are created, how they're generated, how they work, how they convey knowledge, and how we can create new knowledge by using them. And who could be best equipped with an interpretation scheme, uh, if not art historians themselves, because they have always been looking at images, just like visual semiotics, uh, semioticians have. And so I would like to show you a very blurred, I hope this works, a ve very blurred image at first. And uh, if you can look at it, you uh, see it from a kind of a distance because art historians look at images and try to bring an image into words in order to become conscious what we actually see. And the seeing is usually a quite right? unconscious uh, process. So we bring into words what we see from a distance at first, that is the distribution of light and darkness, the distribution of colors, and the overall composition of such an, in this case, still abstract um, image. And you can see, even if it's very blurred, that there's a kind of upper area, a lower area, a left area, and a right area that divides that into uh, four quadrants, so to speak. And if I take the blur out a little bit, you can also see that there seem to be elements that have a certain relation to each other, and also a position in the overall image, uh, in this, uh, and they make sense possibly, at the position in which they are, in the overall composition, but also possibly in the connection and the spatial proximity to each other. And you probably have already guessed which uh, painting it is. It's a painting by Poussin, which has been discussed in the, in the history of art very much in the conferences in the French Academy in the 17th century, mostly. And they have discussed what's the great thing about that image. It is because we can read it, um, from left to right, there's a, there's a figure here that could be us somehow who looks at this group and this group kind of leads to that group who are kind of praying and pointing to the other side. There's a kind of central uh, um, figure here who points to the top. On the very top, you have a landscape that is also back 
foreground and background, and a sky that somehow reflects what's going on in the foreground, because this is the gathering of the manna of the, uh, in the deserts, that is, they are almost starving, and Moses tells them to have good faith and believe in God, he will care for us. But some of them doubt, some of them are praying, and in the end, God sends the manna, something to eat, and they're gathering the manna here, so it's uh, the reward for having, for having strong faith. And also here you have dark, um, uh, dark sky, but this, this light, the sun seems to break through, and that is hope. So this whole painting is not about the gathering the manna itself, but as, an, as on the example of gathering the manna, it's about something more important that is about trust, about faith, about, uh, about uh, uh, distrust maybe, about uh, rewarding in, in, in um, being rewarded if, if you are trustful and so on. So it tells us something for circumstances we all have in our life. But reading that image and having a narrative from left to right that is here's something here's, uh, something happens before an event and here after an event that is only possible because all those elements, all those figures speak their own micro story at the position in which they are. And these are things, and if you look at it closely, they're connections from one figure to the other. And if our eye uh, moves from one element to the other, the story is being told visually. And that's what has been discussed in art theory in the 17th century already. And there have been people like Roger de Pille who wrote in his here translated book, um, Principles of Painting, that composition is about how you as an artist place the objects on your canvas, on your screen, and because they have different meanings, if you place them in an orthogonal way like this, if you have a kind of a cluster situation like that, if you place it in the middle like that, or kind of equal, equal distribution just like that. So all of those things uh, don't necessarily need to be reinvented by us today, but we can look into art history or art theory, because they've been talked about already in the medium of painting, and we can see how much we can use from those art theories in uh, applied to our current digital images. One last example, this is Jackson Pollock, and Jackson Pollock is, of course, a hero of modernism, and some say the innovative thing about him is because he was dripping paint on canvas. I believe that's not the point. The point is uh, rather something else, because if it's just about dripping, some lay people say, I could also dripple on a canvas and look sim in a similar way, similar way, because it seems to be quite random. Truth is, in part, if you zoom into here, maybe uh, those dots are kind of random. So if we look closely from, 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 from close, maybe the position of that dot compared to that dot is kind of random. But the overall composition follows very much a compositional idea, because if you look at Jackson Pollock, he comes from figurative painting, and he has always struggled with overall compositions before he came to abstraction. So he had an idea in mind how he wants to distribute painting over the canvas, and even if in detail it might be somewhat random, it follows an overall idea of composition. So that is my introduction to art history and what we uh, do in art history. We have a kind of distant viewing. We look from afar, just like you. But we can also have a close viewing if you go closer to it. And maybe we go back and forth in the museum because the whole image makes sense from afar, but also if you study details. So, um, but, as you said, my journal is called uh, Journal for uh, Digital Art History. We are digital art historians today. Of course, we are part of the digital transformation. We also make use of data, of computers, and so on. And what we want to do is not only um, bring the conventional structures of our, of our field into the digital age, we also want to create new structures, new methods 
that give us new insights because we are working with data. And that is the difference between digitized art history and digital art history. Digital is that we invent new methods. And using data and digital tools, we hope we create new knowledge and new insights in other ways. But if we have those, those methods, that means we get access to data, we analyze data and visualize data. We also need to understand those methods in order to understand how they create new insights and maybe even new worldviews. In this case, means new views onto the history of art, which is our interest. So the methods we create need to be a part of a new field, which it might be a meta research onto our uh, historical research that means um, uh, a methodology, a digital methodology. That means how do we gain knowledge with digital methods and what do visualization techniques show? What do they hide and what do they make us believe? And maybe they make us some believe something that's actually not the case. So it's a critical meta research, so to speak. So once again, what is art history? Usually, as I said, we go to a museum, like let's go, uh, or stand in front of an artwork, example here, a painting, and look at it closely. But you not always have all artworks in your city that you can visit. So art history has created uh, used a new medium 100 years ago, starting from Munich, that was the slide library that we can quickly get access to almost every art object in the world. And usual slide libraries have been 100,000 objects, uh, usually in, in the departments of art history. So we, this, this gave, gives us quick access to objects about the, of the history of art. But this is, of course, analog. Today, we have digital media. And this is, for example, the GitHub Cup page of the Museum of Modern Art. And we can download 130,000 objects as a database, so to speak, as a spreadsheet, actually. And the difference is, including images, the difference is this we can manually look at with our processor here. This is digital. That means we can process it. We can compute it. We can work with it. We can apply it. Uh, tools to it or, or algorithms and hope to create new knowledge because it's digital. The Museum of Modern Art, 100,000 objects, uh, sounds a lot, but there are more and more museums who publish their data as open data, and that creates more and more an overwhelming amount of digital objects that we have available and that we can grasp with our computers. The only question is, how do we not get overwhelmed by the, all those objects, all those images, but how can we create, mostly at first unsupervised, an order in those, those amounts of millions of objects? How can we create structure? How can we show something that, have, that they have in common or which, which they don't share? How can we show similarities between them? Because they might hint us to certain uh, connections in the background or differences between them. And that's why we create um, um, meta images. And I show you an example here. This is not on the screen, but it should be here now. This is a prototype, uh, but uh, if you like, you can go to artigoviewer.harald-klinke.de and you can try this out for yourself. This is the database of images that we have in our, in our department of artistry in Munich. And we have um, uh, user-generated tag them and so on. That doesn't matter right now, but here you see some of the tags. And here you see by creation date, uh, a kind of plot, an image plot, and the longer uh, this bar is made out of images, um, the more objects we have in that particular year. And we can even um, click on Frau, which is woman, and we can see how many objects were tagged woman compared to the whole corpus, and get an idea of the distribution of women, maybe in the 19 or 18, 1990s, um, there were more, more 
objects in our database that were later tagged as women, so to speak. All right. And the, the cool thing about this is uh, you can also uh, zoom in here and um, look closely. So this again is distant viewing, close viewing, and look at uh, particular objects and get more information about this uh, object and look at it in high resolution. So these are visualization techniques that I show you here live that help us get access to such a corpus. But this is only a timeline. Another visualization technique is what's called similarity. So those image objects are now distributed now on our digital canvas according to their similarity, whatever similarity means in this case. But also here I can zoom in. And for example, in this cluster, you see all portraits in this in this uh, in this corpus, and you can see that if you move to the right, you see uh, paintings with more than one person. Then you see obje objects with uh, two people in a landscape, and if you scroll further to the to the right, you will see only landscapes. For example, you will if you move this to the front, you will see here are abstract paintings. Um, and here are some uh, uh, Asian drawings and so on. So now it helps us to find a way through a big uh, corpus of images because they're now kind of organized according to their whatever this similarity. And it seems to help very much to explore such a corpus. But the question in terms of semiotics, maybe, or in terms of Bildwissenschaft or visual studies is, and also in terms of my meta methodology is, what do those meta images, uh, those visualization techniques actually show us? Why is an image here and the other one there? How is that calculated in the background? What can we actually learn from it? And how can we decipher, understand those kind of images that we have here? And in order to do that, I've, uh, here's the uh, website again, if you want to go uh, click on it and uh, find out for yourself. In order to, that, to do that, I uh, look at um, different similarity systems and the best known is Google Arts and Culture, it's a few years old already. There are others and some are even in development where you have this kind of similarity maps, let's call it them, them like this. And the challenge in such similarity maps, this is uh, Google Arts and Culture, is um, what do the axes of this kind of top topography that we have here actually show? Uh, so the X is the Y X and, and Z, Z axis, and what do they represent? And the other question is, if we have images close together, what kind of similarity does that spatial proximity actually represent? These are questions I think we should pose. And I have a working hypothesis in, in the beginning, what, a, what, a, what an image plot actually is. You probably have discussed this enough in semiotics possibly, but here's my working hypothesis for myself that is in a plot, an object is represented by a symbol, for example, a simple dot. While the image plot, an image object is represented by the image itself, or in that case, maybe an artwork is represented by the image of the artwork in the image plot. But they both have in common that meaning is constituted by its spatial proximity on a canvas where those images appear. Possibly. I'm, I'm curious what you will say. Now, let's take uh, what I've shown you the data set of the Museum of Modern Art. I said 130,000 objects, of which about 70,000 have an image. I've plotted all the images here now uh, according to their position in the database, which is kind of random. Possibly the date of digitization is its position there. And you can see, of course, you could use with 70,000 objects. You may want to zoom in or whatever. 
but it's hard to work with such an amount of images, and if there are millions, it's, it's very difficult. So what we have to do with that amount of images, a big image data, big visual data, is we need to transform them and apply kind of abstraction to it. What do I mean by that? Well, once again, we are interested in the history of art. That's the past. We cannot, we cannot go back in time with a time machine. But there's something coming from the past in our present time. These are the objects of art. So we can study the history of art via the objects of art that were created in the past. If we want to do digital art history, we go through a process of digitization. So if there's an actual object from the past, we photograph it, we create metadata that describe the painter or the art artist, for example, the title, creation, and so on and so on. But this process of digitization is the process of transformation because it is not the same what we gain. In the end, we have big image data. It is something completely different. A painting is canvas and paint and a three-dimensional object. Here we have bits and bytes in the computer, something completely different. But those bits and bytes in the computer, they do represent something in the real world. And that's what data is all about. Data is always something different to what it represents. Makes sense, I think. But if we have that big image data, as I said, it's not only hard to process for our human brain, but it's also kind of hard to process for a computer because the computer doesn't know what's depicted, for example. For the computer, these are just bits and bytes, numbers for each pixel and subpixel, and it's, it's brightness and RGB colors. So what we need to do is we do feature extraction that you mentioned already. And that again is a process of transformation and reduction, maybe abstraction, because it takes some certain elements out of that image that are kind of points of interest maybe, and then again are numbers that represent something in the image with which we can work. And what it creates, it's a feature space. So the feature features are kind of abstract representation of elements in an image that represents artworks in this case. And the more and every feature is um, uh, positions the object in a Cartesian space. Cartesian space is like uh, our world in 3D it has three three axes, and somewhere is a point uh, like a geo uh, location. But if you have more, uh, more features, you have a multi-dimensional space, a multi-dimensional feature space. We don't need to imagine what a multi-dimensional space is. It doesn't matter for the computer something to, to work with and to create something out of it. But the problem is we cannot visualize it. So features are kind of properties in the computer and database that say something about the object, about the image. And the more properties we have, the better we describe that object. It creates a multi-dimensional feature, feature space that we can not imagine, not visualize. So we need to do another step in transformation that is dimensionality reduction. I called my talk the complexity of art that is here. And then we need to go to the dimensionality reduction through a more and more process of reduction and abstraction. But we need to understand this process because here again, we take something away in order to understand more, not less. And in the end, we have that meta image that I've just shown you uh, at the Artigo viewer in an interactive version, version. So how do we study that process? In practice. We need to create meta images and study each and every step in that process. And for that, I've taken a subset of the MoMA dataset. I've taken the first 1,000 objects. 
and I've created meta images with, with it, and I'll show you this. This again is um, in the order of appearance in the database, so it doesn't mean anything, but you can uh, see there are a few brown ones. These are um, architectural drawings on brown paper. So one feature would be the primary color is probably brown. And you here have here a few objects, photos of um, product design and so on, which are also in, happen to be in the database. And for example, this is my example that I will show you again and again where it is. This is, for example, Frank O'Gary's um, uh, rocker chair uh, that has a very distinct um, form that we will recognize more easily in that heap of, of images. Together with those images, we have a database with a lot of columns, and all those columns kind of represent properties. Well, the most interesting properties are those which are numerical, because we can very easily uh, work with them. And here you have begin date and end date. These are actually the birth year and, and, and death year of the artist. We have an acquisition year. We could have the creation year. This circumference and many are NAs means they're empty. 90% of the duration is empty. This is just for movies. But we have a height, width, length, even a weight sometimes, but very, very rarely. That's some sometimes they're empty, doesn't matter. But these could be called features already. Features taken from the metadata, and they can help us position these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven features. So this could create a, a, an 11-dimensional feature space, and we want to project that into a two-dimensional space in order to get an overview. But first I want to show you what a two-dimensional feature space might be. A two-dimensional feature space would be a simple image plot. We have two features on two axes. The x-axis is the creation date. I've taken the MoMA subset with all photos. And I have a feature that is not taken from the metadata, but directly from the image data. It's a low-level uh, image feature that is the average saturation in an image. It's easy to calculate average brightness, for example, just add together all pixels, RGB, and divide them by the number of pixels. You have the average brightness, uh, saturation uh, similarly calculated, and we add this to our database and have an additional feature that is saturation. And what you can see here, is we have a kind of timeline. So the further it's to the right, the, the closer it's to our present time. And the further it's to the top, the more saturation on average is in that image. You can see here that the first photos were in sepia, only a few experimental examples were with different uh, for, for techniques of photography, they are bluish. Then there's, for whatever reasons, a collection gap here, and then start the real grayscale black and white photos on the bottom here, no saturation at all. And in the mid um, 20th century, we have even more images and, and more with, um, with higher uh, saturation, even complete red one here. So this is easy to read because the more it's to the right, the closer it's to our present time, the more it's to the top, the more average saturation is there. So every object has a position according to those two axes, and that gives, gives sense to that very object in this image plot. So these are two features in two conventional feature space. We don't need any transformation or uh, dimensionality reduction. We could also use the, this is um, from paintings. I've taken the uh, most important, uh, most present color in every painting. And I've put a, a, a dot in a three dimensional cube on R, G, and B, where those objects are located. And you see uh, there are some of them are very bluish, some are very uh, kind of orange, and some are even very black. And this is just experimental, maybe it makes not much sense but shows three features that are G and B uh, in the uh, pre predominant color. Or another cube, wonderfully animated. This is, I just take height, width, and length from my metadata, and I put a dot uh, in my cube on all over those three axes. And I find, for example, the longest the longest object in the MoMA collection of uh, architecture and design is a helicopter, which is almost as long as the room is. You know, so we can 
without going into the database, we can directly take from this visualization the object and see the, the, the biggest, longest um, objects, for example. So now, but now imagine if we had more than three features, we need more than three axes. How does it work? Maybe you can imagine a fourth as time over, over time changes over time. But if you have 11, like in the MoMA database I've just shown you, there's no way to visualize that. So we need to apply, let's call it algorithms of dimensionality reduction. What does that mean? Very simple. Imagine you have a three dimensional object like this head and you shed light on it and it's projected onto a wall and you have a two dimensional shadow. So this is three dimensional and this is two dimensional. So this is a dimensionality reduction. However, a, loss, a lossy reduction because the depth is totally gone. You know, we reduce it by losing one dimension. And that's not good because we are losing kind of information. What we actually want is we want a transformation of data from a high dimensional space into a low dimensional space so that it retains some, retains some meaningful properties of the original data. And I stress some meaningful properties, whatever that is, but it works and it helps very much and I'll show you some of them. Because there are algorithms in mathematics some 100 years old, so even before the times of the computers, that allow us that dimensional reduction, even if you have 4,000 dimensions that can be reduced to two dimensions, for example. One is the TSME, or usually called TISNI map, that is usually used for some rather aesthetic reasons, to be honest. There are others I don't need to explain right now, but what algorithm you use defines very much the visual appearance of the resulting meta image. And as you can see, um, a PCA has different um, distribution of objects than the Tisney map. This is uh, made easier to look at because it's more. Um, uh, the each and every drop object has more distance to each other compared to the LDA. But there are also other factors that you can control that um, um, have an effect on the final, final visualization. So now I said I want to do that digital methodology by practice. So I take the Museum of Modern Art objects, our 1000 uh, subset, and take those 11 features from the metadata, run them through a Disney map, and visualize them on screen. And here's the result. So first, as a plot, we have just have dots for each object. And what you can see here, it's a kind of more or less equal distribution. You have some lines here that maybe mean something, maybe not, we don't know yet. But we seem to have clusters, for example, that cluster, maybe that are objects that are close together because they're somewhat similar according to their 11 features, right? But it doesn't tell us much because they're only dots on, on, a, on, on a screen. And I have to tell you that several factors, uh, as I said, uh, constitute that, that, that map, of course. Uh, some one is called complexity and and the, the data itself, the features itself, and so on. And we need to keep in mind here we have no axis. Before I showed you x and y axis, makes sense, or it defines the meaning of each object in the position. Here we have no axis, it's an axis less visualization. That means that dot constitutes its meaning not because it's on or globally here but it constitutes its meaning because it's close to that one and far away from that one. Hard to understand, but you will understand in just a minute. This is the plot, and we want an image plot. Sorry, we replace every dot with the image itself, and this is what it is. What you can see here now is almost magic to me when I first saw it for the first time, because in our metadata, as you have seen, there is no data about the content of the object. 
it doesn't describe that it's a brown uh, architecture drawing. But if we use those data and run it through Tisney, uh, through, through Tisney we still have clusters where all those brownish paperworks are clustered together. That's almost magic. We just need to know it's, uh, it's no causality between the data and our visualization. It's mere co coincidence or co correlation, that's the right term. So that's correlation between the features we've had and the actual appearance on that image that they are close together, closer together, for example, than this, uh, this cluster over here. And you can find our rock, rocker chair uh, here, and you can also find um, um, abstract paintings and objects of, of design rather in this area compared to the, to the uh, objects of architecture in this area. But you should keep in mind that behind the projection is, for example, the, the birth year of the artist, and that seems to cluster them together. So it's not by content, actually, but by metadata, but it appears as if it's uh, clustered by, um, by, by data about content. So I have rerun this Disney map creation several times because I found that there's no one-to-one -one connection between our data and the actual visualization. Actually, the TSNE, the S stands for stochastic, and that means in the end, there's a random factor in it. So if I rerun that, you will see these are all Disney maps based on the same feature data than before. But every time I run it, I see a different image, and all those images are kind of similar to each other, but still very different, or different but similar at the same time. You can see this cluster, for example, which was there on, uh, before, and um, it's still readable and usable because we find certain things clustered here, even if they appear because it's axis less on a different on a different part of the screen, but they are together and far away from those, for example. Our brownish papers are here right now. And here's our chair. Now, um, as I told you, Tisney is not the only dimensionality reduction algorithm. There's also the PCA that I've shown you, and these are the same images, the same features projected using the PCA algorithm. And you can see again, it's somewhat different from the overall appearance, but still we have those, uh, those images uh, together. And if you zoom in, you can see that again, we have uh, some relations of those objects to each other. And as I said, the local relation, this local proximity is important for making sense to each and every object in relation to the others. I've also done this with, um, oh, this is uh, the size, by the way, is also a factor, because if you don't find the chair, for example, you can make it smaller because it's also overlapping and different algorithms have more or less, less overlapping and so on. This is um, the PCA algorithm with, based not on the metadata features, but on features um, taken from a, net, uh, from a neural network. And that neural network is based on ImageNet, which is uh, well known, and neural networks have certain layers, and each layer has a certain uh, level of abstraction, and you can take certain layers, and there every image is kind of represented by numbers again, very not visible. But we can take those uh, features from the neural network and make it the basis of our projection again, PCA2, and you can see it's more widely distributed, no more of that kind of gaps. Uh, our, our rocket chair has been there. This is um, an algorithm, a neural network that's called paintings, which is of course interesting to art historians. This is a neural network where you can, that allows you to identify the painter of a painting. So it's been trained on uh, artists' names and, and images. And this um, uh, set of features that are created from this neural network 
uh, create, even if it's the same algorithm, PCA, creates a more, uh, I would say, more aesthetic appearance because the features from the painter's neural networks take features that are more stylistic, more visible, or vi visual, more interesting to the identification of who's the actual painter. So the global appearance is much more like a distribution of color and, and saturation and so on, which in on a global scale is interesting, aesthetic, maybe even informative. But if you zoom in, you find that those objects are quite different to each other in content, not in style, but in content. And if the more you zoom in, the less it seems to me um, useful for an art historian to work with. While the inception network that we've seen before has less of a global impression that gives you an overview, but if you zoom in by content, the objects are more similar to each other and more maybe more useful to an art historian researching, exploring such a uh, such a corpus. Here's our chair again, and. Um, we also have uh, a neural network uh, uh, similar to Inception uh, that's also based on ImageNet that's called VGG19. It has uh, 19 layers in uh, image recognition. And we take those um, um, features, by the way, 4,096 features. Whatever they represent, it really doesn't matter at this moment. Um, we could investigate in that. But we just take the features and see this kind of visualization in the MDS algorithm, for example. I'll just show you them as examples. We could study them one by one longer. That a meta image created with features and um, dimensionality reduction algorithms can create very different um, meta images. And we need to understand the, the factors, the elements of this of those generate uh, generations in order to better read or un understand and analyze those images. Here's our chair once again, and I think that's almost the last one. Um, inception uh, neural network, this uh, MDS algorithm, and uh, there's the chair, and this is a paintings network again uh, with uh, MDS this time. There's our chair. So what are the defining factors? This is preliminary. Everything I speak about is preliminary. We are, I'm at the beginning of this project. But maybe defining factors are the features we use, metadata features, low-level features, such as average brightness, but also high-level features, for example, taken from a neural network. Factors can be the dimensionality reduction uh, algorithms, such as the ones I've shown you here. But I think in the end, there's much more. If we are historians who want to work with such a system, we have to look at all those levels that we are using. First level is which corpus are we actually using? You know, MoMA has been my usual example, but there could be different ones, different data structures as well. What features do we take? As I said, the painter's neural network features are different kinds of data that represent something else in our in our, in our sources that are some metadata features alone. Also, what similarity model do we have? What data analysis methods do we have? For example, we can calculate clusters. Massimo has uh, spoken about those things. Unsupervised clustering. How does the computer know that things are similar or dissimilar to others? Pure mathematics applied to computers apply to images, but very possibly very helpful to us. And in the end, the uh, visualization methods. And here are some examples of what elements we can try out and see the outcome of the meta image. And in the end, this should be um, something interactive. We have meta images output. We have feedback because it's interactive, my example on the website. And maybe this turns into a recommender system for art, for art historians because the art historian as a researcher has such a system and the computer even learns about the interest, the research interest of that particular user. But that's future. So what have we found so far? I believe a few points. For example, the appearance 
and epistemic benefits of such meta images is defined by various factors, as I told you. Some of them are the choice of features, the choice of reduction algorithms. Second is, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between the original data and the reduced data or the meta image, the, uh, the resulting image, but a random process might be involved and we have to test that. Third, we distinguish between the constitution of local meaning and global meaning that is more or less what I said in the very beginning about a distant view and a close view, uh, looking at everything and looking at details. And some plots constitute meaning along an axis and others don't. For example, our image reduction has no axis, but still that applies. All right, findings so far. Now, as an art historian, you could say this kind of axis-less similarity visualizations are nothing new, except that we are using digital technology that creates, generates that automatically for us. And I'm referring to Evibado, for example. And that is true. Here are images that he placed next to each other because there's somewhat a relation between them and it's important that this is one is here and not there because the story that he tells is a story that that jumps from one object to the other however what Abibabo most probably did was not talking about visual similarity alone but about a kind of semantic network between those objects and the whole, whole cultural history that is represented in that image depicted here as a cardboard um, a print or in our case as a digital representation. So what we want in the end, if the computer should help us gain knowledge using images of artworks, is that the computer as a recommender system, for example, creates meta images, interactive meta images that include not only visual features, as I've shown you with those neural networks, but has a kind of representation of cultural knowledge in the background. Is that total future? In some ways, not because we have that kind of data. That's data from wiki, wiki data. Which data is huge data, very bad data, but huge and very usable because it's linked open data. And what you can see here, linked open data can connect to terms, what is depicted in that image. But it also connects to other images, to collections, to, um, to artists, and is a huge network of semantic connections to each other. And maybe there can be a, a background layer of our system that then creates, again, a very different kind of visualization where the distance is calculated according to the other objects, but how much they are connected on those, those um, edges could also be weighted. Um, how close it is to other objects, to other artists, to other concepts, to our other terms to other collections and so on and so on. Maybe this makes sense. We have to try out. It's a very complex question, but I think it's the way forward. And the way forward is also what I think are further investigations. First, I would like to see in practice what are the defined factors for our meta images, right? Because only then we can explain how those elements were created, what the overall compositional idea is, and also that one and on, on a local scale. And I would like to do this uh, with practical means with the use of data science. But we also need to be humanities researchers. And I told you from my point of view as art historians, we have hundreds of years of art theory in our backpack and we can use it for this kind of new kind of visualizations and I believe we can make use of our knowledge, our historical knowledge of, 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 of images that we can apply to those new images and I believe we can also uh, use theory like semiotics, like visual studies and maybe even more 
uh, what uh, Massimo has uh, mentioned, to better understand that visual phenomenon in, a, in an interdis interdisciplinary way. And behind that might also be a mathematical approach, because stochastics, well, how, is, how much randomness is in the Tisney map creation? Well, we need to go into the very fundamentals of mathematics that are in the program. And in the end, a historical approach, because all those dimensionality reduction algorithms were not invented last year or fell from heaven. Some have a long story and were invented for maybe different purposes than we use them today. And for certain purposes where a certain kind of visualization was necessary. And what it doesn't mean if we apply them now to art historical objects. Maybe they tell us a story about medicine and not about art history in the end, because they were created for another purpose. And also some of them are a reiteration or an improvement of other algorithms and so on. So a historical approach would be also good. So what are the challenges? The question is, how can we create knowledge from visual data? That was my initial question, I think, in this talk as well. And that's a general question where also we'd like to know your, your opinion. What are the features of images that we need for which kind of research question? So someone who might be interested in portraits wants to have a cluster of portraits. Someone who's interested in a uh, geographical situation where portraits are maybe involved, maybe not, maybe wants to use a different kind of feature set or different kind of uh, dimensionality reduction algorithm, all those elements. How do meta images help us understanding the history of art in another way? That is the ultimate goal of digital art history. We want to create new, a new understanding of the history of art because we are using new methods, in this case, computer methods. How can we learn to read, and read is a term from textual sciences, images we don't actually read, we look at them, we decipher them maybe, we understand them, we comprehend them. How can we learn to read meta-images by making use of visual studies built in just in semiotics? And again, how do we understand what such meta-images of big image data show, what they hide, and what they make us believe? And how do we develop a critical user interface studies for art history, maybe? And talking of art history, this is my last slide. What do I mean by knowledge generation with digital means in art history? What is, art, what, what is our ultimate goal in art history? I believe art historians not only do exact science. Exact science also part of art history, that is, Dating, when was it created, who created it, and all those questions derived from stylistic analysis and so on. This is more or less exact science. But it's also we create meaning. We look in the past and we have an interpretation of what happened in the past for current generation. And that changes from generation by generation. And maybe those methods can also help us in sense making. Because art history is about storytelling. We are telling a narrative, the story of art in the end. If art stories were here, they could discuss that. But I take this point for the moment. That means we lay paths through, the, through a network. And this semantic graph I've shown you before, maybe in the end means that we jump from one node to the other. And that is our story of art that we choose in this very moment. And the computer as a companion for us researchers might be the recommender system, system that shows us the next possible node to jump to. That means we need to understand how meta images are generated. And the first steps I've shown you. And that needs a meta research in digital methodology. And this can best be implemented on an interdisciplinary basis. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm interested in what you think about that and your questions. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ralph, uh, for showing us uh, various uh, visualizations of images. Uh, each of them has a specificity in uh, analytical insights. We saw um, 
meta images by content, by style, by metadata, by low level features. It was uh, it was very complete, very 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 useful to, to really to, to have an idea of the of the variety. Uh, I would like to ask you two questions. I'd like to know if uh, in the room there is someone else. No? Maybe one little question. Okay, so I know that it's only you. So my re really brief uh, uh, questions. The first one, you spoke about complexity of, of uh, work of art. Uh, in your title, uh, you spoke about, about complexity. But when I see um, that uh, we reduce uh, the, uh, an image to an average saturation, average brightness, average outline, and so on, it's, it's, not your, uh, it's not your fault, but the man which does like that, and so on, I, I ask myself, uh, the brightness, uh, the brightness or the, uh, the saturation uh, average. Uh, I agree. Do, 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 do say nothing about the image because, as I said to Massimo, the problem of a work of art is the totality, is the holistic, is the complexity the, of, the, of the totality, so an average. Okay, we agree. Uh, but I, I, I was sure that you. Okay, I, I quickly give you an answer. Uh, I'm sorry for having too long my my presentation. Average brightness becomes just one possible feature, and yes, of yes, course, yes. average is difficult yes. because it summarizes something that cannot be summarized. But other features can describe the image in different ways. It's like looking at the image from different angles, and one could be counting the edges counting uh, the blobs of color in there, and so on and so on. And, and uh, data scientists have thought hard what kind of features you can extract from it. And sure, this is always an abstraction, a representation, mm -hmm. a transformation that by itself doesn't say almost nothing. But if you have 4,000 of those features, sure. it, it can describe the object in a data sense quite well. Sure, I agree. Second, uh, very uh, quick uh, uh, question: How do you? How can you um, create a storytelling from the um, meta images? How to um, transform the paradigmatic? <laughs> um, meta images in syntagmatic. Uh, syntagmatic uh, elements or uh, in uh, narratives. Difficult, we have not done it yet, but there's a process of development in this in information science, for example, that you uh, can create text to speech that's in every, on every Windows machine, uh, um, audio to text, for example. We have image, image to text. Uh, we have now uh, um, uh, possibilities to turn text into images. Mm -hmm. um, yes. and, and the question always is what data can we use in order to uh, uh, come to a certain goal? And I believe it's just a hypothesis we need to try out um, uh, that a semantic web could be a basis for a narrative. I've tried it out with my students in a very small project. And with our very small data, it turned out we can create a narrative, but a very, very boring one. Because we had only certain connections, but the more connection types we have, edges, the more we can tell real sentences. Mm -hmm. So maybe again, this is a, a question of complexity, mm -hmm. but maybe 10 years we will be somewhere where a computer can write an art historical text by making use of semantic data. Mm -hmm. Maybe not, but on, as I said to Massimo, we, we have to walk the path to understand where it leads to and where the challenges are. And even if it doesn't work, in the end, we've learned a lot. Yes, 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 sure, sure. <laughs> Sure, thank you. Um, uh, I, I, I forgot to ask to the online uh, 
people, uh, if someone has a question as well, if possible, to ask a question. Uh, well, Maria Giulia, if I may, um, if I am still allowed, it's uh, it's now dark in UK, and uh, I, <laughs> I I I didn't want to uh, miss anything of the lecture, so I didn't switch the light on. And um, it's uh, well, uh, first of all, congratulations. I mean, it's it's a wonderful um, um, new path of scholarship, and and I see how it developed since the last time you know, I had an opportunity to listen to you. And um, the second question is more a, a curiosity. This um, weeks I'm, I'm uh, uh, following the lectures of a, a famous uh, anthropologist of images here in, in Cambridge, um, Philippe Descola, who is normally at the uh, Collège de France, but is here to deliver this late lectures. And uh, he's presenting the English version of the book that has uh, been published in French uh, about the, the anthropology of figuration. And um, I, I was actually thinking about his materials while I was uh, um, listening to you, because uh, in some way, connecting together um, artifacts that are not usually connected by traditional art history might be a very promising field for this kind of uh, um, approaches and methodologies. Um, it would be extremely stimulated to um, somehow um, test these these tools in areas where art historians haven't actually ventured so much you know like some anthropologists like les Collard are doing it now but uh it is quite uh, challenging at the same time inspiring to uh, think about the possibility of connecting a certain artifact uh, uh, made in australia uh, by indigenous populations with an artifact uh, made in uh, in western British Columbia by and see like where the patterns uh, somehow converge uh, by using also the aid of artificial intelligence. I don't know like if you have thought about this possibility, certainly it is in the field and uh, to me it sounds like a, a very um, fascinating opportunity. Yes, thank you. Um... I, what I believe is we have the possibility to tell other stories of art with those tools. Fascinating stories, unexpected stories, but it might also be a kind of risk because we might discover connections that were uh, hidden for good reasons. Or, uh, to speak positively, you said um, examples from two parts of the globe might be connected somehow. In the end, it might show us that borders of countries or cultures make no sense because in the end, we're talking about images and humans. And that, as far as I remember, has been kind of the idea of Malraux when he spoke of the Museum Without Walls. That yeah. It's not so much about all the things art history usually talks about, but it is about images and the equally distribution or equally accessibility of, of, of images might lead to other interesting insights that, that we didn't have had before because somehow they were pre-structured. Now they will also be kind of pre-structured, but as I said, we need to investigate in how those new structures and orders are being constituted or generated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. Um, the last question by Cedric, if you want. Thank you very much for this presentation. It was very interesting. Um, when you talk about meta image, uh, the concept of meta image, you, you say that uh, meaning is um, related uh, with the topol topological disposition in the meta image. So uh, I assume that um, we, as a specialist uh, of visual culture, we have, we have to study also the design of this kind of topological, topological sorry, disposition. And a second quick question is about uh, the user user interactivity. You you show uh, as 
um, some some uh, some some uh, image that uh, say that you will have uh, some feedback from the from the, the from the user. I know this is uh, maybe the, the first the beginning, the beginning of the project, but have you some idea how a user will interact with uh, this kind of design? And also, uh, how do you um, uh, will use the feedback that uh, this kind of user will uh, can, can give you? Uh, first, quick uh, question back: What do you mean by the term "design"? You use the word "design" like right? uh, the, the topological exposition. Um, um, show some some form, some uh, visual um, like diagram diagrammatic um, disposition of the graph or of the image. And this is what I say called design of the of the meta image. Meta image. Because I think that you spoke about uh, mm, meta images by axis and meta images without axis. So I think that it has to do with this. Um, uh, when we do not have axes, because I think that axes are uh, a very important uh, uh, reference for uh, the meaning of uh, uh, the, position, uh, the position of the images, uh, when the axes uh, disappear, uh, Yes, we have their relations between the images, okay, but uh, we don't have the ultimate reference, uh, average of saturation, average, and so on. So I think that uh, it would be interesting to uh, imagine another design uh, uh, that do not need axes, you show something, um, but um, without axes it's, it's difficult to, uh, to understand, uh, yes, the, the, relation, the relation between the object, yes, it's clear, but uh, the pertinence of this uh, similarity, similarity uh, for what? Uh, similarities uh, uh, in relation of what? Uh, I think that uh, I don't know if uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if but, but it's all the same elements, question. All those elements we talked about, we just mentioned that there can, can be axes or no axes, that can be a reference to the other images or to a global coordinate system, but not necessarily, um, and, and so on. These are elements that constitute that kind of um, uh, a meta image. And we need to study that, as I said, by, by practice. Um, there was another one I've just forgotten, but uh, user um, mm -hmm. feedback. You probably know, whenever you use Google as a search machine, Google learns from you, because it plays a cookie in your browser and knows where you clicked upon and that you are interested in certain things and certain things not. Because you click on the third uh, result, and the first result, you seem to be more interested in the third one. So the search machine learns from you. If you clear all your cookies and go to, or go to another machine, you will find that different results. So the search machine learns from the user that has an idea of what the user is interested in. Okay? And the same is possible with such a system. And we could um, analyze the click screen, watch the images you use, but the idea is that you can replace all elements. You can replace the, the, the image source, you can replace the, the kind of features uh, used, if you can replace the uh, image dimensionality reduction algorithm, probably most important, mm -hmm. and so on. And if someone says, for example, I am interested in stylistical questions, he or she will possibly mostly choose um, the features from the painter's neural network. And so we offer this user more often that algorithm compared to another one. So similar to any um, search machine or inquiry system or recommender system, the, the idea is that the, uh, the computer uh, as a system learns what has been searched by various uh, users. That means the user model. 
But this, as you said, is at the moment an idea, but uh, yeah, not the recommender system, but the, uh, such a system that replaces uh, elements uh, that are already uh, projects, and hopefully we will see more of them. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that we have to, um, to finish uh, here the, the, the seminar of today. It's uh, half past five. So I thank you very much, the audience online, the audience here, Massimo and Harald, for their generosity, and uh, uh, see you, <laughs> see you uh, on December the 14th for uh, two other talks uh, by um, Jeremy Amers and. Uh, um, Guillaume Soulez. We hope that the info will be established. Uh, have a nice evening. Ciao, ciao, Massimo. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Maria Giulia. Bye, Harold. Thank you. It was great. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.